Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Pitcher Partners, McMahon Clark and the Melbourne and Sydney Compliance Committee Groups, welcome to the Compliance Forum. We're delighted to host this webinar today and thank you for joining us. I'm Selena Nutley from McMahon Clark and I'm pleased to welcome you to the Compliance Forum webinar. We have today over 400 registrations, so it's great to see this forum is proving as popular as ever. As the corporate regulators rethink their strategic priorities in the current environment, there's a raft of new regulatory and compliance issues ahead for the financial services sector. In today's webinar, I'll kick off with a discussion about what you need to know about ASIC's focus on fund advertising and marketing. Uh, then Elliot Stum will share the benefits and drawbacks of the new CCIV regime and some lessons learned from securing the first CCIV license in Australia. Elliot is a partner in McMahon Clark's funds management team. And finally, Brent and Chan will analyse the impacts of current and topical tax issues for managed funds, including the tax aspects of the new CCIV regime. Brenton is a director, investment funds at Pitcher Partners. We've deliberately kept the format of today brief with presentation scheduled for 45 minutes so that we'll have plenty of time to respond to your questions at the end of presentations. We encourage you to submit questions to our presenters through the presentations via the Q&A box, which we'll respond to at the end, time permitting. We'll also be providing links to the presentation and a recording of the webinar in the next few days. Uh, so a little bit about me, I lead our lit litigation team and have extensive experience in commercial litigation and dispute resolution in the funds management, financial services, real estate and corporate sectors. Uh, in the funds management and financial services area, um, my team and I assist clients with managing the contentious relationships between trustees, investment managers in, and investors, regulatory investigations, including AFCA, uh, and disputes arising from the licensee authorised representation uh, relationship. So, as I said earlier, my topic today is on advertising and marketing of products. Uh, for those of us who are signed up to the ASIC alerts, which I imagine is pretty much everyone on this forum, uh, you would see um, and what seems at the moment an incredible amount of releases that come through concerning marketing and promotion of products. So this is a really topical um, uh, presentation. So moving on, um, I'll just give you a brief overview of where we'll go in this presentation. Uh, so firstly, we'll talk briefly about the sources of the uh, obligations regarding advertising. We'll look at some of the um, recent acts, acts actions from ASIC, uh, the possible consequences of breach, and then we'll, we'll walk through a few case examples uh, to put these in a practical context. So moving on, uh, the next slide is me, we don't need to dwell on that, uh, and on to obligations regarding advertising. Now firstly I'll say that there, uh, there's quite a bit of content in these slides, I'm not going to go through all of it today, um, but as you'll be receiving them uh, after the presentation, it's a little bit of a handy reference tool in case you need them in the future. When we talk about obligations for advertising, uh, there's a number of different areas. So our starting point really, our touchstone is 912A of the Corps Act, the core obligations, um, and what we sometimes call the VIBE obligation, that licensees have to do uh, all things necessary to ensure financial services are provided efficiently, honestly and fairly. Um, accurate ma marketing and promotion of products falls right within the scope of that duty. So um, if products are marketed inaccurately, then um, not only is it likely to be a breach of the Corpse Act, but it's a corresponding breach of the uh, financial services license. Uh, on the right hand side, you'll see I've referred to some specific sections of the Corpse Act and the ASIC Act, which also deal with these issues, um, in addition to the general law uh, and um, liability under the information memorandum or the PDS. Most ASIC guidance is tailored um, on to retail investors and historically that's where we have seen a lot of the activity, um, a lot of the regulatory activity. Uh, so Reg Guides 234 and 170 are um, the, the Bible, so to speak, when it comes to marketing and promotion of uh, products to retail investors. However, what we're seeing more and more is that um, even though they don't necessarily strictly apply to wholesale um, investors and products, um, what is um, accurate and what is um, appropriate marketing is assessed by reference to those regulatory guides. So um, my very strong view is that um, regard should be had to those even if it isn't strictly required at law. 
So moving on to our, um, our next slide, we're going to talk about uh, two recent projects from ASIC. So um, before, I think it's fair to say before this, we hadn't seen um, real coordinated projects um, in recent times anyway about advertising. So in 2019, ASIC kicked off its True to Label project. It shortlisted, if we can call it, about 350 funds and then um, undertook a targeted surveillance of 37 funds operated by 20 REs. Um, these funds were um, identified through data analysis. This was a, a um, multi-jurisdictional, a, a, a multidisciplinary, I should say, project so that the ASIC investigators were working alongside their tech teams uh, to uh, conduct this data analysis. And they looked at product names, labeling practices, and through that, there were two significant concerns right, which were identified and they became the focal point. So confusing and inappropriate product, la uh, product labels, um, i.e. true to label, and also redemption features not matching liquidity of underlying assets. So moving over to the next slide, um, you can see some of ASIC's guidances on um, their expectations on labelling um, and the use of cash in um, products and labelling products was something that was concentrated fairly heavily on um, with this um, project. So um, cash use uh, are only permitted to use that term if your assets are predominantly cash and cash equivalents. Capital stable is a term that we'll talk about in one of the case examples uh, and you can see there it's not simply that there is a diversification of um, asset types, asset classes, but that there has to be a significant portion in defensive assets such as fixed interest investments and cash. So um, this is um, really topical in the context of the True to Label project. So moving on, um, you'll see this is an extract from a media release. So what happened um, with this project was there was um, the targeted communication with various REs um, and arising from that targeted communication, certain corrective action was taken. And that corrective action gives you an idea of the concerns that ASIC had raised. You'll see that um, the, the type of activity is, uh, or corrective action is summarized at the bottom in the press release. Um, and it really related around refinement, um, withdrawal of of um, marketing material. There was some, there was one RE at least who changed the name of their product um, to have regard to ASIC's concerns. Um, and you will note that um, this, this me media release doesn't name the funds or, and doesn't name the, uh, the REs concerned. Uh, if we move across to the next slide, you'll see um, arising from this was some inevitable um, uh, uh, a publicity in the Fin Review. So on the left hand side, you'll see that there's a report about 13 firms um, were required to modify their dealings. The, that article was written as a result of the press release. The one on the right hand side, um, in contrast, names some people. And that's because the Fin Review um, made a freedom of information request wanting copies of all the correspondence between the responsible entities and the uh, and, and ASIC um, that arose from that press release. So um, some funds were successful in being able to resist that FOI request. Um, some of our clients that we acted for were able to, um, to resist it, others were named. Um, but what you can see here is um, an increasing transparency or a focus um, publicly around those who've had to make amendments to their advertising. If we move across to um, the next slide, we then talk about the current advertising project. So the last project was about true to label um, and it was about making sure that um, the products, the way they were marketed, the way that they were labelled, match the underlying assets. Um, the 2022 advertising project has a different focus. So it talks about um, misleading performance and risk representations, making people think that products are safer or less risky than they are. Um, not only are we looking at traditional and digital media, but um, the there's a significant focus um, on search engine advertising and what keywords we may put in at the back end to have the products display in searches. Um, and that makes it a, a markedly different exercise to what we would have seen in the past, but really gives um, context to the way that um, currently these products are advertised. 
Um, what was also different was ASIC um, was very um, clear in saying that not only are we targeting retail investors, we're going to look at unsophisticated wholesale investors. So that cohort of the market that may meet the wholesale test um, because of their asset holdings, but nonetheless are quite inexperienced. It's almost a de facto raising of the wholesale investor threshold um, in a way. So, it, and it's part of what we've seen more and more um, ASIC seeking to protect that segment of the market that um, may um, qualify as wholesale but have um, no real investment experience. So these examples that are set out down the bottom come from the uh, come from letters that our clients have received from ASIC. Uh, so the things that um, that were raised was um, the absence or the prominence of disclaimers and qualifications, risk information about the products, the use of the phrase up to, um, also the use of ranges. And these ones I, I, I understand. Um, anyone who's met me knows that I love to shop. And if I see a sale that says it's up to 50% off, my brain is always going to assume that that coat that I want is going to be 50% off. And then I'm sadly disappointed when I discover, in fact, it's only 10% off. Um, so ASIC's point um, was that when you use the phrase up to, or when you use a range, people are conditioned to look at the upper end um, as opposed to the, um, the lower end, which might be a more realistic um, uh, demonstration of, um, of returns. Um, the use of strong headline claims became quite a focus. Uh, the letters even talked about different size and colour fonts for different aspects of the ad um, in the sense that um, ASIC was concerned um, a different font was used and made um, some content less prominent. All of these things are actually addressed in RG234. Um, so there is best practice out there, um, but they had not, I think, been raised in such a coordinated way um, until recently. So we move over to, to the next slide. Um, and you'll see this is an extract from the most recent media release ASIC has released as part of um, this 2022 project. And you'll see it's very different to the first release we looked at in that this names the, the RE or the trustee, um, it names the product and it sets out ASIC's concerns and the action that was taken to address it. This came as no surprise because ASIC was quite um, quite clear in its um, communications that it intended to be transparent around what um, concerns it had raised and who it had raised with them. Um, and then we move across to the next slide and you'll see again um, the fin review footage uh, coverage which shows uh, you know it effectively names and shames um, the the people that have uh, the entities that are set out in that media release so we're seeing a greater focus on transparency um, in these projects and um, I you know I think that it's likely to be something that we see the likes of class action firms monitoring these types of media releases to understand um, the scale of um, issues raised with advertising. So if we move on to the next slide, um, talk about possible consequences, and then we'll talk through some case examples. So most of these consequences are well known to all of us. Um, we can be exposed to claims for damages from investors, civil penalty proceedings where um, individuals and corporations are subject to um, very large fines, um, imposition of license restrictions, Adverse publicity, not just in terms of the um, Fin Review, for instance, but um, actual court ordered publications. Um, insurance issues has been a really big one for the industry generally. So not only at an individual fund manager or um, product level, but industry wide, um, the activity around these types of issues has seen exits of some insurers from the market and made it much more difficult for some people, much more costly to obtain insurance. Um, and then the last one there is the stop order, um, which is uh, an, another tool that ASIC has started to utilise um, increasingly with advertising, and we'll talk about an example um, in a moment. So moving on now, um, our uh, re recent judicial decisions, um, one thing I wanted to highlight about this quote is um, it's not just, ASIC's view is it's not just about taking actions where investments are marketed as um, safer than they are, but when search engines are used in misleading or deceptive way to entice investors to products they are not searching for. So we really need as an industry to broaden our perception of what is advertising um, and what can be caught within the spectrum um, of, uh, of misleading conduct. 
So we'll move on and consider the first of our case examples, which is Latrobe. Uh, Latrobe between, for about a three year period, very heavily marketed two particular products, the 48 hour fund, the 90 day fund. Um, and they, in the advertising, it portrayed that investors could receive their, um, Ret, ret, could ret, receive their investments back within 48 hours or 90 days, depending on the product, when in fact the constitution allowed up to 12, 12 months if the fund was liquid. Um, they also used the term capital stable in all environments in some of their advertising, which was problematic for ASIC because underlying it, these were mortgage funds. Um, so ASIC had raised a series of concerns with um, Latrobe. Latrobe had very, been very cooperative. It had amended its um, advertising. Initially, there were um, disclaimers on separate pages. They were brought to the same page. They were strengthened. And the final product showed that um, while the very close to the headline claim, the name of the fund, it said um, in quite clear language that um, despite the representations, there was a 12 month period. So at the end of those modifications, ASIC said we have no more concerns, Latrobe. Latrobe thought it was fine, um, goes along with its advertising, and then lo and behold, a little while later, it received some federal court proceedings. Um, it came out swinging to begin with, but ultimately admitted to the contraventions, and it said that the qualifications weren't prominent enough um, to make people understand that there was no that there was a risk of losing principal, um, and that um, the redemption period was significantly longer than the fund name implied. Um, as you'll see there, Justice O'Brien was really hesitant about the fine that ASIC and Latrobe had agreed. Um, he wanted it to be more than just the cost of doing business. Um, but ultimately, what got it across the line was the fact that um, Latrobe had a very strong compliance culture and um, ASIC had, it had cooperated with ASIC the whole way along. So if we move to our next case, which is about Mayfair, uh, I'm confident that everyone on this webinar has heard of Mayfair and um, knows um, uh, really about the issues. But um, the, the central issue with Mayfair was that um, it was targeting mums and dad style investors um, who were looking for really safe products um, when the underlying product was really quite inherently risky. Um, there was a, um, a the, 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 the products collapsed um, and investors ultimately um, have lost funds as a result. Uh, so ASIC instituted proceedings against Mayfair um, seeking um, a whole range of sanctions. Um, the court made four key findings about misrepresentations that are set out on the left of that slide there. Um, and ASIC had asked for a $15 million penalty, which in itself is pretty significant. But the court said, actually, we think it should be double that. We think it should be 30 because this conduct was so deliberate and there was no remorse. Uh, now, I don't know who did uh, um, Mayfair's search engine optimization, but they were a little bit of an evil genius, I think, because they came up with more than a million keywords, which showed up 13 million um, times. So the reach of these products was enormous and the court considered that when it looked at the penalty. Um, that penalty was appealed by Mayfair, um, ultimately um, affirmed on appeal, so um, no luck in, in reducing it. Mr Marwini was banned from promoting financial products for 20 years. That was overturned on appeal largely on procedural um, grounds, so we'll see that be reheard by the federal court in um, the months to come. Um, the companies were also permanently restrained at first instance from using certain terms, and it was a really long list of terms and very basic terms like term deposit and um, uh, and the like, that was overturned on appeal because the um, injunction was found to be so broad to be unworkable. But I think it's also um, still a good indication of the type of relief that a court can seek, um, what asset can ask um, and what a court can impose. Um, Mayfair was also subject to adverse publicity orders, uh, which required it to publish things in newspapers, um, eight newspapers from Townsville to, um, to Adelaide, um, send information to its database, put it on um, the website. Uh, so now we have just two um, more examples to talk about really briefly over the next slide. 
Um, this is something that was launched uh, just last week, ASIC's launch proceedings against Latitude Finance and Harvey Norman. On the right, you can see the, um, the ad that is in question has a very bold headline claim of 60 months interest free. Uh, but what ASIC says that that ad doesn't disclose is that you only get that if you sign up for a Latitude credit card and that credit card comes with significant um, monthly and annual fees. So it's not the 60 months interest free that you might um, believe as a result of this, you know, very um, uh, bold red headline. We'll see how that plays out over the next few months. Uh, and so moving over to the last case example, um, this was a Faulkner, this is Faulkner Properties. It's not a case example as such, but it's an instance where ASIC um, uh, exercises its stop order powers. So um, it considered that a PDS um, that Faulkner Properties had put out in respect of a product um, was misleading, particularly in, re in relation to inappropriate comparison to lower risk investments and the use of outdated performance numbers. So it issued a stop order which prevented Faulkner May from issuing, selling or transferring units uh, in the product. So it's quite a, um, a significant tool that ASIC has in its arsenal. Uh, so our final slide is just a little bit of a summary of some key takeaways and tips. Um, and if I can just re reiterate a couple of points, and that is have regard to two, uh, RG234, whether you're in the retail or the wholesale space, um, have a look at the words you use, make sure they're clear, they're, um, they're not ambiguous, they don't convey different meanings. Um, and Latrobe, if Latrobe has shown us anything, it is that sometimes a really bold headline claim, you just can't disclaim your way out of it. Um, some things are so clear that you, uh, you just um, can't contextualise it any other way. And overall, the impression that's conveyed is misleading despite the best attempts to um, contextualise it. So always look at the ad as a whole. So that is a brief foray, foray into the um, advertising uh, um, activity um, by ASIC. Um, no doubt we'll see more in this space. Uh, now I'm going to hand over to uh, Elliot to uh, talk for us through the world, the brave new world of CCIV. So I'm Elliot Stum, and for those of you that don't know me, I'm a partner in, in um, McMahon Clark's funds management team. I um, have a sort of subspecialty in the regulation of investment product issues, issuers and their related service providers. So what I'm talking to you about today is this new CCIV regime, which I find to be really interesting and I've spoken about and touted quite a lot, um, as some of you may know. So um, just as an introduction, the standard spiel of what a CCIV is, is that it's a new type of company limited by shares that can only have one director, which must be a company must have at least one sub fund and one shareholder, but can have many sub funds and many shareholders. Um, and it was really introduced in Australia with the key policy objectives being international recognizability, um, investor protection and flow through tax treatment. So the biggest sort of aspect of this new regime um, is the idea that we've got an investment vehicle that is a company and that's been designed for collective investment. So this is a really big shakeup in Australia's fund space because it's been dominated by the trust for decades. Um, so this is a pretty big step and um, I think it's pretty exciting as well. Um, so it, it has been a long time, the um, you know, it's, it's taken a long time to get here where we are. So I think it was first mentioned in 2009 that Australia really did need a corporate collective investment vehicle um, for those reasons, um, you know, international recognizability. Um, it's been back and forth for a number of years. We had some consultation in 2016. It disappeared. Um, 2021, um, bill was tabled, it was passed. And as of three months ago, the, the regime's now here. So um, some of the big questions about this, or the biggest one really is, will it, will it be used? And um, I think I can say with quite a lot of confidence that it will definitely be used. Uh, and the real question is, when will it start to become popular and widely used in Australia? Um, so I guess on that point, um, it's going to take a while, I think, for it to become widely adopted. Um, before it's going to be um, widely used, we've got to see a few things happen. So advisors need to be across it, planners need to be across it, platforms need to be um, open to listing it on their on their platform. There's quite a few things, but I think it um, it will get there eventually. And just to sort of indicate where things are at, we got the first CCIB license um, at the end of August. And since then, I think ASICs, or at least the last time I checked, ASICs issued 
one retail wholesale CCIV license, and I think five wholesale licenses as well. So it really is coming, um, but that's just the authorization. It comes to be seen when the first CCIV hits the market. So I'll talk about CCIV, um, CCIVs quite a bit more, uh, but for now, I just want to talk through its competitors. So firstly, I'll move on to trusts. So trusts are the obviously the dominant investment vehicle in Australia, and they've served us really well for decades. Um, some of the big benefits of trusts is that we've got flow through tax treatment. Um, and another big uh, benefit of trusts is capital flow. It, it's really easy to get money into a trust and it's really easy to get the money out. So the main problem with the trust in the funds space is the absence of any sort of a legal personality. So the trust is not really a vehicle, so to speak. So we treat it as an entity, but as you'll see on the slide, a trust really is a term that describes the whole set of obligations that are imposed on a person, being the trustee to hold property for the benefit of other people. So um, in, when we're talking about a trust and how it works, the two legal sort of entities involved in the structure are the beneficiaries and the trustee. So um, that sort of creates a lot of issues for the funds, um, funds industry, which we've been trying to manage as lawyers for years and, and mitigate the impacts of. So Basically, we've got trustees entering into every single contract and things like that. We, we do what we can to try and limit a trustee's exposure to liability through you know, limitation of liability clauses and things like that, um, but it's not perfect and it's not ideal. So that's the range drawback of a trust, that it's not a separate legal entity. Now, moving on very briefly to companies, um, because they're not the greatest vehicle uh, for funds, but... It does have one pro, and that is that it's a separate legal personality. I'm sure it's got other pros, but that's that's the key one. Um, it does have drawbacks, though, um, the biggest of which being um, how easy or how hard it really is to get capital out of the out of the out of the company. So you have to go through a full prescribed process in the Corporations Act, and it's nowhere near as easy it is, as it is for a trust. And of course, another issue is the tax treatment. So um, the company is a tax point, um, so there's no flow through. Now, I'll now then go back to the CCIV. And um, so moving on to the CCIV, the um, CCIV really is the, a combination of what's great about a trust and a company, and it does away with those negatives that I mentioned before. So just to repeat the standard spiel, CCIV is a type of company limited by shares with only one director, which must be a company. Um, I like to describe a CCIV as being you know, a special type of company that's like a trust and is designed for collective investment. So, I mean, when we talk about where the CCIV came from, as I mentioned, one of the key policy drivers was this concept of international recognizability. Um, so that's really been pushed as the reason that we introduced the CCIV regime. And what people have, I guess, rightfully taken away from that is that this is the sort of vehicle that fund managers should use if they've got a global investor base and that they're looking at raising foreign money. Um, the problem with that reasoning is it's sort of... Um, overlooks the reason why a CCIV or corporate collective investment vehicle became so internationally recognizable. Um, so it became recognizable for a range of reasons. I mean, really we had uh, Europe with the, the USITs or UKITs, I get confused about the pronunciation of that, but they came in, I think in the eighties and then the UK followed suit. Um, basically there has been this consistent identification for the need of a corporate vehicle. And that's really what we need to think about when we're approaching the CCIV and why, why you would use it. It's those underlying benefits and not this concept of international uh, recognizability. The funny thing with the international recognizability is it's actually debatable as to whether or not people have had issues with raising money overseas using a, a trust structure. Some of our clients think that it's not a problem and they've been able to do it quite easily. Others think it's a material issue. So the ability, I guess, this benefit of international recognizability kind of hinges on a fund manager's distribution network. Um, so that, that's really all I'll say about this concept of international recognizability. Um, I'll keep going through CCIVs, but for now, I just want to talk about two key concepts, um, corporate director and sub funds. So moving on to those two now, um, one of the really interesting things about a CCIV, and that's a completely novel concept in Australia, is the idea that a CCIV is a company that can only have one director, can't have any alternate directors or anything like that. Um, not only are we limited to one director, but that director has to be a company. Um, so you see that in other jurisdictions, but not in Australia. In Australia, we've always had um, individuals 18 years or over that, that can be a director, never a company. So it's, it's quite interesting. Um, and it sort of does 
create, I guess, some um, understanding issues about how that actually might work. Um, so basically, it all works on a flow through basis. Um, and the, I, the, I guess the easiest way to understand how a corporate director works is to think about it again in the concept of trusts. So um, at the end of the day, there are natural people sitting in the background and they're the ones actually doing things. So when they do things, it's taken to be the corporate director that does things, the company, and when that company does things, they're doing so in their capacity as director of a CCID. So you can kind of think of the board of directors of a responsible entity. So they sit down and they meet um, and they pass a resolution um, as directors of the responsible entity. And then they say that resolution has been passed by the company in its capacity as trustee of a trust. So the same principle applies with corporate directors. You've got the natural people meeting, passing a resolution, um, which is a resolution of the company. And then the company is passing that resolution in its capacity as corporate director of, of the CCIV. So it is a flow through kind of thing that, that, um, that is how that works. The other um, key thing that I'll talk about just now is sub funds. So sub funds is a, um, the term sub fund is really quite unfortunate. And I've found that it is um, a term that really gets people stuck up in understanding what a CCIV is and how it works. Um, and really the, the confusing point is the use of the prefix sub. So in the, in the fund space, the term sub is typically used in the context of a trust. So we say a sub trust. And the term, the prefix sub is generally used with the meaning below. So a sub trust sits below a head trust. So instinctively, people would think, okay, a sub fund sits below another fund. So the CCIV is really a master fund sort of structure with these things being underneath it. Um, but that's not the way that term is meant to be read. So when you look at the prefix sub, um, we're really thinking about it not in the context of a, a submarine or something that's below, but more something that's a part of another thing. So like subset. So a sub, a sub fund is a subset of the CCIV. It's one part of the CCIV and the CCIV can have many. So I would have much preferred it if the term sub fund was not used and the term fund was used. Because when people are investing in a CCIV, they're really investing in the sub fund. Um, so that's, that's the set of assets, that's the sort of the investment strategy, the pool of assets and things that, that someone wants exposure to. So technically they're investing in the CCIV, but really their, um, their investment in the CCIV is referable to a particular sub fund. Now, the interesting thing about sub funds um, is it creates this idea or it forms this idea that a CCIV is an umbrella vehicle. So you can have many of them um, in the one structure. So um, we have the, tr well, the trust structure um, looks to do that as well. So we have, you know, trusts out in the market that have multiple classes of units. Um, each class can be referable to a certain thing as part of assets or what have you. They might be issued on certain terms that gives them certain rights and so forth. But we do use um, the trust as a master vehicle where you've got different sub uh, classes which give people different rights and, and things like that. So the trust is not a great vehicle for that. Um, and one of the reasons is that, you know, if we move aside from this concept of sub trusts, is that these assets are all held as part of the one the one trust. So if something happens to one asset, it can taint and impact all the other assets because they're all part of the same pool. A, a class of unit in a trust is not a separate entity and the whole trust is not even a separate entity. So it's, it's not a great umbrella vehicle. Um, as lawyers, we do come up with a whole bunch of ways to make it work well in that context, but it does take a lot of work. Um, a CCIV just does that. It's a key feature of the CCIV that you've got these sub funds that are separate from each other. So a sub fund is not a legal entity. So it, it, it is still part of a CCRV, um, which is the legal entity, but under the, under the Corporations Act, for all practical purposes, they are. So um, each sub fund is uh, a separate, uh, segregated and separately regulated and protected part of a CCRV. So that can most clearly be seen in the context of external administration. So one of the issues that fund managers have had over the years is this, this idea that if a fund goes bad, an uh, external administrator is pointed, appointed over the trustee, which impacts all of its business and things like that. It can have big implications. In the context of a CCIV, um, when, a, when there's an external administrator appointed, it's appointed over or in relation to the sub fund only. So if, if we're looking at a property fund where you've got three sub funds, um, each with its own real property asset, if 
you know, the 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 um the inflows aren't great for one fund, and then there's a default on the um uh, on the loan, uh, uh, sorry, on the um the debt facility, then receivers might be appointed. That impacts the sub fund, but not um not the other sub funds. So they're all kept completely separate. So I'm just running out a bit of time. Uh, sorry, running out of time here. So I'll just move on to the next slide. Um, so this one here depicts what a multi-class fund looks like. So as I said, we were talking through this just before. You've got different classes. They've got these dotted lines around them because there's no legal entity here. Um, I've got the trustee put quite prominently here because that's the legal entity that does everything. So if the, the trust is entering into a contract, it's the trustee that enters into the contract. So it really is at the face of this structure. So I'll just move on now to what a multi-sub fund CCIV looks like. Now, the two big things that you'll notice here is this bold and prominent box around the vehicle. And that's to sort of identify the fact that this is a separate legal entity. You won't see the word corporate director in there. And that's to demonstrate that the corporate director is not the face of this vehicle. The CCIV itself is, and the corporate director sits in the background. So when a CCIV is doing something, it's the CCIV that does it. So a CCIV enters into a contract, buys an asset and so forth. The other thing I've just demonstrated here briefly is that we've got these different sub funds. So they've got a dotted line around them um, to show that they're not separate, separate entities, but I put a little lock there just to sort of make it clear that even though they're not legal entities, they are separately regulated um, and segregated from each other. So very briefly, I'll move on to the next slide. Um, and I'll just touch on these points quickly because um, CCIVs are a fascinating topic for me and I could talk about them for hours, but I think I'm running a few minutes over already. So I'll just um, tidy this up pretty quickly. So just like we've got in the managed investment scheme world, this concept of a registered and an unregistered scheme, we've got this concept of a retail CCIV and a wholesale CCIV. So something will be a retail CCIV in, a, in the same way as something will need to be a registered scheme or it should be registered. And that is um, if a person has acquired an interest in a CCIV or in a managed fund in circumstances that that person needed to be given a PDS, um, then that's what triggers this idea of a scheme generally needing to be registered and a CCIV needing to be a retail CCIV. So that same principle applies. Retail CCIV is subject to much greater regulation than wholesale CCIVs. Um, one of those aspects is this eligibility to be a corporate director. So as I mentioned, the corporate director is the entity that runs the show. Um, a corporate director has to be a public company, um, which can present an issue for wholesale fund managers who often run their business as a PTY LTD. So if you want to move into the CCIV space, you've got to become a public company. So you've got to have at least three directors. So that's one drawback of this regime. Um, you need to have an AFS license that authorizes you to operate the CCIV, kind of like an RE authorization, um, but a little bit different. And one of the key differences between a retail and a wholesale CCIV is that to be the corporate director of a retail CCIV, at least half your directors um, need to be external. So this concept of a compliance committee just does not exist. Um, if you wanna operate retail CCIVs, at least half your board needs to be external. So I might just leave it there because um, we've already touched on licensing briefly, to, briefly sorry, um, to operate a CCIV, you need to have a license that authorizes you to operate that CCIV. Um, CCIV is a company, so it needs to be incorporated and registered with ASIC, irrespective of whether it's wholesale or not, it comes alive when ASIC registers, registers it as a company. So that's kind of one other drawback of the CCIV, um, CCIV regime is that there's this concept of registration that doesn't exist um, in, the, con in the, um, the world of unregistered schemes. So that's a very, very quick overview of the CCIV regime. If you've got any questions on any of the things that I may have glossed over or any other aspect of the regime, please submit a question. Um, but for now, I'll just hand over to Brenton to talk through tax and um, also, you know, as part of the CCIV as well, how that's, that tax regime works. And thank you very much, Elliot. And hi, everyone. And thank you again for joining Selena. Elliot and me for today's briefing. And my name is Brent Chan. I'm a director in the tax advisory group at Fitcher Partners. And for those who aren't aware, Fitcher Partners is a national association of independent full service accounting tax audit and advisory firms. And is one of the largest national firms outside of the big four with a particular focus in servicing the middle market. I've been practicing for over 13 years and I specialize in advising fund managers and operators with the tax structuring aspects of launching new investment product funds, including investment level tax advisory, as well as the associated ongoing tax compliance obligations for funds as well. Now, before I talk further on tax issues 
I just wanted to highlight for those that weren't aware that it is National Mental Health Awareness Month during October and a gentle reminder for us all to continue looking out for and after each other where we can. Now, for the next 10 minutes or so, I'll be talking to some current and topical tax issues and updates in relation to the managed fund space. And with the time left, um, I won't be able to talk to, to, the, to the items in great detail. Um, so if there are any items that you'd like to further discuss or learn more about after the session, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or any of your other future partners, advisors or contacts as we'd love to continue the conversation. And so what are we covering today? And firstly, I'd like to provide a brief update um, on recent HO activity in the fund space. The second item is not a new issue, but certainly a very important and topical one that, uh, that comes up often on HO reviews. And that's in relation to the MIT capital account election and why fund operators should pay attention to the mid status throughout the fund term. The final item is in relation to the new corporate collective investment vehicle regime, the CCIV regime, which Elliot touched on earlier. Where we're currently at with tax, some of the potential benefits and some key watch outs to round out the session as well. So given time and constraints, I will launch straight into the topics so as to allow some time for questions at the end. And so what are we seeing in terms of recent HO activity in the fund space? And since the HO announced at the TIA Financial Services Tax Conference back in March 2020, that there would be increase in their review focus on managed funds that were either MITs or AMITs, we have continued to see a wave of HR review activity in the fund space. And in the past six to 12 months, we have continued to see a particular focus on property funds and property asset disposals and the tax treatment of these transactions as being a key focus area. And this comes as no surprise given the ease of access to public information um, around property transactions, including, for example, the AFR and commercialrealestate.com. And for one particular property fund client, we've had three separate requests for engagement with the HO in the past 12 months. So certainly not dropped off in terms of activity and engagement with taxpayers in the space. So how are the ATO engaging with property fund managers? And the ATO continue to engage via more formal means um, through, for example, ATO reviews and audits on a post-lodgement basis. However, we have seen a significant push uh, from the ATO towards engaging on a pre-lodgement basis via its commercial deal assurance program. And whilst the program is offered by two streams, being the early engagement assurance or early engagement advice streams, Practical assurance is only provided any tax positions agreed upon with the ATO under the early engagement um, assurance stream. And we have found this stream to be particularly helpful towards our clients, particularly where the client has worked closely with our team to have any positions supported prior to engaging in the process. And so what are some of the uh, key takeaways or learnings towards successful engagement? And in addition to having a robust tax governance policy and framework, we found that where fund operators and their advisors are well prepared um, in supporting any tax positions taken with respect to their property disposal transactions. This generally is, leads to a low risk rating um, outcome from the ATO. And from our experience, the key questions raised by the ATO broadly with respect to the capital versus revenue treatment of disposals, including whether the fund is a qualifying MIT or AMIT that has a valid capital account election that's in force in the year of asset disposal. Or in situations where the fund is not an MIT, that there is appropriate support that the property or properties are held on capital as opposed to revenue account. And as such, its investors should have access to the capital gains tax discount um, on any capital gains generated. And that's all I'll mention in relation to that item. The next item I'd like to briefly touch on is in relation to the Managed Investment Trust capital account election and why it's critical for fund operators to be mindful um, of the mid status of their funds at various times during the fund term, depending on the type of fund being operated. Now, to provide some background on this issue uh, for those who aren't aware, where a managed fund meets certain conditions, including the membership test and non-trading trust requirement, to name a few, they will have the ability to make what we call the MIT capital account election to effectively secure treatment of its assets for tax purposes under the capital gains tax regime, which means the fund and its investors should be entitled to the capital gains tax discount for any gains generated on disposal. And this treatment is not a given where a fund has not made such an election and will need to prove in the event of an ATO review on a case-by-case -case basis that they should receive equal treatment. I'd like to highlight that uh, we have seen this issue pop up time and time again, particularly as a key review question during almost all managed fund ATO reviews dealing with disposals of fund assets. In particular, the timing requirements of this election are often not well understood and has resulted in some out outcomes or bad outcomes for some funds and their investors. 
Now, critically, depending on the type of fund being operated, I wanted to highlight the critical time with which fund operators should be paying attention uh, to a fund's ability to satisfy the MIT requirements and to ensure the MIT election is valid and in force when required. So for larger equity funds, it's absolutely critical that a MIT assessment is made at the time of fund establishment. And this is because where an equity fund is eligible to make the election but does not do so, it'll be precluded from making the election in future and will result in the loss of capital gains tax treatment on disposals of shares and units. And unfortunately, we are finding that a number of fund operators in this space have missed this issue and have only found out in some cases in the year of disposal that a valid election was not made. And it's important to note, however, that where a fund has made the, the election and has maintained its status in the year of asset disposal, that we have not generally seen the ATO challenge uh, CGT treatment for equity funds. Now for larger direct property funds, and unfortunately, unlike equity funds, they're unable to simply apply the safe harbour afforded under the MIT election. Um, and it's critical that the MIT status of the fund is monitored throughout the term of the fund, and in particular, prior to the year of property sale. Now, what happens in the year of sales, it takes you back and requires you to meet a whole lot of conditions under what we call the non-trading trust requirement. And what this requirement requires you to do is effectively look back at the primary purpose of holding the property asset and whether this is primarily for the purpose of generating rental income or was it for a different purpose. And where the fund can prove that the primary purpose was for the generation of rental income, then it's likely this condition will be satisfied and the safe harbour under the mid election should apply. However, where you are unable to support that the primary purpose for the investment was for rental purposes, it's likely the fund will lose its ability to access the MIT capital account treatment. It's worth noting, however, that where a property fund fails a primary purpose test in the year of sale, that this may not be fatal by default and result in revenue treatment, particularly in the current climate and state of the economy with rising interest rates and other factors, where it can be substantiated that the sale of the property and subsequent return of profits and capital to the investors has been done to preserve the investor's capital, the disposal may still be treated on capital as opposed to revenue account. However, we still strongly urge um, fund managers to consider these, these issues and manage them well ahead um, in, of the year of disposal of those assets. Now, the final item to briefly touch on, sorry, just uh, given time constraints, so I'd like to briefly touch on the, some of the tax aspects of the new CCIV regime. And as many of you be aware, the broad policy objective of the CCIV regime is to increase the attractiveness and competitiveness of the Australian funds industry, as mentioned by Elliot earlier, by offering a more familiar structure for offshore investors via a corporatized flow through investment vehicle regime. It will certainly be interesting to monitor the level of take up of CCIV structures over the next few years, particularly as some of the teething issues and are being ironed out and to find out whether the new regime will be a success. And whilst we are broadly supportive of the regime and the tax framework, we think there are some critical tax issues, which I'll highlight later in this presentation, which may pose problems in practice. And we do, however, expect the ATO to be providing practical guidance on these items in the not so distant future. So what are some of the key tax features uh, for a CCIV? And to start with, there is only one legal form CCIV, which is the company and the investors or members of the shareholders in the CCIV. The investors shares are referable to a particular sub fund, which provides for various rights and obligations outlined within the constitution. Now central to the CCIV tax framework, this new concept is deeming rule or principle. And for tax purposes, this new rule has been introduced, which deems a trust relationship to exist between the CCIV, the related business, the assets and liabilities referable to a particular sub fund and the members or investors of the CCIV. And these sub funds, with their segregated assets and liabilities are treated like existing unit trust. Flow through treatment. So for Australian tax purposes, CCIVs and sub funds should be entitled to flow through tax treatment, provided they are not public trading trusts. And this means that CCIV members should be taxed on their proportionate share of sub funds taxable income, despite the fact that the CCIV is a legal form corporate entity. Now the income components uh, flowing through to members should also retain their character. For example, income classified as interest, dividends or discount capital gains, should retain their character in the hands of members or investors. AMIT treatment. Now, one of the key objectives of the tax framework for CCIVs was to align it with the existing AMIT regime. And we believe this is a sensible and pragmatic approach. Where a sub fund meets the AMIT criteria, similar to the MIT requirements outlined earlier, with some additions, it's treated in the same way as AMITs and should have access to the majority of the tax features, including the existing unders and overs regime for carrying forward tax errors, Dean fixed trust status for carrying forward losses and franking credit flow through, as well as the ability to attribute tax on a fair and reasonable basis to investors, just to name a few. Now, finally, sub fund status. So while sub funds are not recognized as legal entities, they are treated as separate unit trusts for tax purposes and can have their own separate tax registrations, including TFNs, G 
GST registrations and the need to file separate tax returns. And so what are some of the key benefits and opportunities? And I think Elliot already highlighted a number of these. So I'll probably skim through quite quickly. Now, firstly, CSIS may be attractive to fund managers looking to operate master or platform style structures uh, due to its clear asset and li liability segregation model. And it's just comparing this to existing multi-class unit trust structures. Whilst the tax attributes of a specific class can be quarantined or ring fenced to investors who have a proportionate interest in the class under the AMIT rules, the inherent risk of cross-class liability has still caused problems commercially. And this risk is effectively mitigated under the CSIV structure whilst retaining the ability to quarantine the tax attributes of each sub-fund to the relevant investors. Cross-investment between sub-funds. Now there's also ability for sub-funds to cross-invest to other sub-funds. This may provide greater flexibility to create different investment structures in a more efficient manner. So for example, a sub-fund could set up to hold core assets with additional sub-funds being set up to holding varying levels of exposure to that initial sub-fund, depending on the investment strategy of each subsequent sub-fund. And this last item, I think Elliot had covered already in great detail, so I'll move on from that. So lastly, what are some key watchouts for tax for CSIVs? And whilst we're generally supportive of the broad tax framework for the new regime, there are a number of residual items from a tax perspective that uh, are likely to require practical guidance from the tax authorities. And I'd like to touch on three of these. So firstly, in relation to the tax treatment of sub-fund trust that do not qualify as an AMIT, based on current legislation, there is a significant risk of taxation at the top marginal rate to the CSIV due to the mechanism with which tax is um, currently being allocated to investors. So for effectively, new rules require that members are made presently entitled to the income of a sub-fund trust that is deemed to be equal to the profit determined under accounting standards. As a simple example, where a sub-fund trust makes an accounting loss but has taxable income, this could result in the CSIV being assessed on taxable income. The second risk item um, is in relation to the various ta ta state taxation regimes and the current lack of an ability to accommodate the new CSIV regime. And without amendment to the current rules, the status of CSIV sub funds as not having a legal identity could result in unfavorable treatments depending on the circumstances. So for example, if CSIV sub funds are not recognized under sta state tax legislation, the sub funds may be subject to grouping rules under both the landholder and land tax regimes, which could have very negative consequences. And lastly, there's currently no transitional specific rollover concessions for AMIT's looking to convert into CSIV structures. So it's likely that any CSIV structure being set up would need to be from the ground up. So in summary, whilst we're supportive of the new regime from a tax and commercial perspective, there are still a number of items that we think will require further guidance from the tax authorities, particularly where a fund does not qualify for AMIT treatment and for multi-property CSIVs that may be impacted by the state taxation rules. That then brings us to the conclusion of the presentations and now I'll move on to the Q&A component of the session. Yep, the first one here is, um, how can the industry accept naming and shaming or even the slightest administration issue oversight? I think the first one there is probably uh, to Selena, if you don't mind taking that one. Yeah, sure. Um, so the, the, the comment is, um, as Brenton said, about the naming and shaming and um, the balance is retail industry participation is hard enough. Why should any RE business accept this when it seems more about asset virtue signaling rather than investor loss likelihood? Um, look, I, I've got to agree with you, not, not necessarily about the asset virtue signaling, um, but the, the prospect of naming and shaming over every um, over every oversight. Um, my view, and um, it was one of the ways that we managed to resist the Freedom of Information application um, about that first press release is if you want um, participants in the financial services sector to engage with ASIC freely um, and uh, cooperatively, you need to, they, there needs to be some level of protection um, to those communications and they need to understand um, that uh, there are modifications or there are some changes that can be made to practices without necessarily being broadcast to the, the broader industry and the investor base. Um, otherwise, people stop wanting to cooperatively um, engage. Um, I think, you know, that, that is a real issue for the industry. If I look at it from ASIC's perspective, I suppose what they would be saying is that they have um, a remit that requires them to be transparent with the public. And um, if you haven't done anything wrong, then you have nothing to be afraid of. My personal view about how we manage it, I don't think that practice is going anywhere. Um, I think it has to be a messaging with your investors. Of course, primarily do the right thing and then optimistically you won't end up um, in trouble with the regulator or if you are contacted by the regulator, 
seek help early, but messaging with investors is going to become increasingly more important, getting on the front foot and looking at how um, you explain these things so that your investors are already aware before it comes out in the newspaper. Thank you, Selena. That's, um, that's great. So just then moving on to the next question that we have here, I think it's uh, it'll be for Elliot. Yep, so the question is, under what circumstances might ASIC consider you a CSIV, even if you are not a licensee? Um, well, I guess just as a, as a sort of starting point, um, ASIC can't really consider someone to be or not be a CCIV. So a, a CCIV is a kind of separate kind of concept to every other sort of company. So a, there is a real difference here between the CCIV regime and the managed investment scheme regime. So um, the way that a managed investment scheme is defined in the Corps Act is that it, it it doesn't say an MIS is a particular structure. It kind of describes what is happening with the structure. So a whole bunch of things can constitute a managed investment scheme. Um, but with a CCIV, you don't have a similar principle where it talks about a company that makes investments and so forth. To be a CCIV, you have to be registered as a CCIV and a PTYLTD or a public company can't be a CCIV. Um, so hopefully that um, covers off your question. Thank you, Elliot. And, and the task question here, so if a CSIB is to be treated as an AMIT, does the withholding regime on distributions apply also along with other AMIT rules around tax statements reporting? And the short answer there is, yes, we are waiting further practical guidance around those items, but the short answer there is, is, is yes. Uh, where, where a sub fund trust does meet the AMIT rules, we expect that all the, all the uh, um, uh, follow on reporting obligations should also apply um, there as well. So hopefully that answers that question. There's one here around uh, to provide a comment on the on the UK's link fund services Woodford litigation in terms of CSIVs in Australia. That might be one for you, Elliot. Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess with the link Woodford situation, I mean, I, I've got to admit I'm not in across all the details, but from what I understand, it's a, a liquidity style um, issue with the with the fund where a whole bunch of assets were held. They were liquid. Um, they weren't able to satisfy withdrawal requests, and that created a whole bunch of issues. That broad concept applied to the CCRV world um, is nothing new, and it applies equally to the managed fund rule um, as well. Like we might all remember from the GFC, there was a whole liquidity crisis. Um, so it, this is sort of issue is not unique to CCRVs, just because the UK has that sort of corporate structure. Um, it applies equally to all sorts of investment funds. So um, yeah, hopefully that addresses your question. Happy to discuss it further. Thank you, Elliot. I think there's time for one more, and uh, the question is, can you please explain further what you meant by being careful when using a range when advertising returns? So maybe that's one for Selena. Yeah, um, I guess what I mean is whatever whatever you put in terms of returns, it's got to be fairly representative of what people receive. So you can't pick a month where, um, for instance, your returns were really high and quote that as, a, um, as part of a range if um, it's not representative of what um, investors receive on an ongoing basis. Uh, and the same with the lower range. So it is, um, it, it, I think it's, uh, about the accuracy of the information and making sure that it's a fair representation. So in the case of ranges, um, the problem we run into is that people will always stick to uh, that, that upper range will stick in their mind. So um, if you um, if you adopt um, a uh, if you give one figure, um, then that is close to your average um, or that is close to the, the usual performance, um, then there is one figure that people keep in mind versus, um, you know, a, a, a range of performance levels across um, periods of time. Um, the more, generally speaking, with advertising, the more detail you put in there as well, the greater the onus is on you to make sure that it is continuously up to date. Um, so when you're putting ranges in, uh, you need to make sure that both ends of those spectrums are continuously um, accurate. Um, so it's, it's, it's a dicey one and I know that it's a hard one for the industry because um, if you can't advertise your um, expected rate of your return or um, what is the, been the previous rate of return, how do you attract people to your product? So um, it, it's a bit of a catch-22, but um, accuracy and making sure that the overall perception that is created by the use of those figures I think is really key. 
And uh, there are some further questions, but unfortunately we are out of time and it's uh, it's 1.30. So uh, we'll certainly will endeavour to try and get back to you as soon as possible on, on your questions. Um, but it looks like that's it for time. So with that, and on behalf of Mel the Melbourne and Sydney Compliance Committee groups, with Martin Clark and Pitcher Partners, thank you for the opportunity to present to this forum. Can I please also please thank my uh, co-presenters, Selena and Elliot, for their fantastic presentations. And just a reminder that links to the slides and recording will be distributed in the next few days. And as mentioned earlier, for more information about anything discussed today, please feel free to reach out to any of the presenters. Our contact information will be available in the post-webinar email. And thanks again for joining us today and hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.